Good morning. I'd like to welcome you. Thank you so much for coming today to our sixth annual consumer conference called Stepping Forward, Staying Informed. The conference is part of our Stepping Forward, Staying Informed Consumer Education Program, which is a two-part program, an annual conference, uh, which occurs each year in the fall, and you're here today for our sixth annual annual, annual conference, as well as a bi-monthly evening lecture series. The overarching objective of the program is to provide an opportunity for individuals with spinal cord injury to learn about the latest research, emerging treatment techniques, and quality of life issues from leading scientists and clinicians across the country. Since its inception, we have provided educational opportunities to over 1,500 individuals, approximately 50% of whom are individuals living with spinal cord injury. This year, we have also made this conference available nationally. We are streaming live over the internet to individuals in their homes across the country. Thank you to all of you who continue to support this program by attending the lectures and the conference. I'd also like to thank all the staff and volunteers who are here today. Without you, we would not be able to put on this program. And so we're very grateful to your dedication to uh, the program and to people living with disabilities. I'd also like to thank the speakers who are here today. We have Susan Halley from the Reeve Foundation. We have Mark Nash from the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis. And we have Suzanne Groa from National Rehabilitation Hospital. Dr. Sherry Lavella was also supposed to be here to speak after lunch, but Dr. Lavella unfortunately had a death in her family late Thursday evening and is unable to make it. So what we had decided was that we would extend each of the speakers uh, question and answer time so they could take some extra questions and answer them from the audience. So Dr. Lavella unfortunately will not be here uh, to give her talk. I'd also like to thank the funders for this year's conference, which is the Paralyzed Veterans Association. The PVA has been so generous in supporting this conference over the years, and we're very grateful for that. And we're very grateful for Deb, who has been uh, an, over, um, uh, an overarching supporter of ours with the PVA. I'd also like to thank the sponsors who are out front, and those include South Shore Medical Supply, Restorative Therapies, Aero Innovative Research, Allergan, BrainGate 2, Right Away, and Rogerson's Orthopedics. I'm also very excited today because one of uh, the most delightful women that I know is going to be emceeing our program today, Lisa Hemmerly. Lisa and I have known each other for a long time. Lisa was one of the first patients I treated when I come to Boston Medical Center almost 11 years ago. Lisa is the deputy, deputy director of the Economic Initiative at the Boston Redevelopment Authority. In 2007, Lisa graduated with honors from the Kennedy School at Harvard University with a master's in public administration. In 2000, soon after her spinal cord injury, she founded the New Hampshire chapter of the National Spinal Cord Injury Association, which she ran until 2008. And after eight years, the organization was merged with the Granite State Independent Living Center, the state's largest cross-disability services providing nonprofit care to people with disabilities. Prior to that, Lisa worked as a CPA with KPMG as an auditor and a consultant for both domestic and international banks traveling around the world. She's an active uh, member within the New England spinal cord injury community and serves as a valuable member, member of our advisory board at the New England Regional Spinal Cord Injury Center. Besides the U.S., she has lived in Germany, the Netherlands, and China and traveled extensively. We are honored to have Lisa today as our MC. And so I will welcome Lisa up to begin the program. A couple of other things that I'd like to remind you is that, and Lisa will also remind you of these things, um, but there are evaluations. If you'll be sure to fill out the evaluations at the end of the program, there are also suggestion areas for future topics, in particular for the bi-monthly lecture series. And the bi-monthly lecture series is really consumer driven. So the topics that you put are the topics that you will hear in the upcoming year. As well, if you uh, get up to leave the room, if you'll make sure to just push your chair, if you're sitting in a regular chair, if you'll just push your chair back into the table, this helps to keep the aisles clear so that people who are in wheelchairs can navigate the room. So it's very important to make sure that you push your chair if you're in a regular chair back in toward the table when you rise. So once again, I'd like to welcome Lisa and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. I'm a little nervous, so if everybody could just say good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here today and to, to be here with all of you and to have the honor of emceeing this wonderful event. Um, just a few administrative items before I introduce our speaker. Um, we just want to make sure that everybody turns off their cell phones and we want to um, just ask everybody to not use Wi-Fi um, because we are streaming live over the internet right now. Um, another thing is that the, uh, we are recording today and um, the recording will be available in about January on DVD, just so you know that. Also, there are volunteers around the room and they have blue tags on. So if you have any problems, if you just want to let them know, um, and you know anything from the, you know, the temperature to where the, uh, the facilities are and things of that nature. We're also going to have a Q&A session, as Steve mentioned, at the end uh, of each speaker. And I'm going to come up and facilitate that. And there'll be volunteers around the room with mics. And if you could just wait until a volunteer comes to you with the microphone so that we make sure to actually hear your question and to get it recorded. Um, so you will be on TV. And um, now I'd like to introduce our speaker, our first speaker, Susan Howley, is the Executive Vice President of Research for Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Um, she started her career uh, in the spinal cord injury field in 1982 as the Director of Administration for the Stifle Paralysis Research Foundation and then became the Executive Director of the American Paralysis Association. Um, and today she serves as the Executive Vice President, as I said, for research at the Christopher, Reeve, um, Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Um, she was charged with implementing a strategic expansion of the Foundation's research program, which included the development of the Transitional Research Fund, the North American Clinical Trials Network, and the Neuro Recovery Network. Please join me in welcoming Susan Howley. Good morning, everybody. It's really nice to be here. I want to thank Dr. Williams for inviting me. Um, I'm not a scientist. I don't have a PhD or an MD after my name. So what I do is administer the research programs of the Reeve Foundation. Um, it is true that um, I got into this field back in the early 80s when there really wasn't much going on. And in a sense, you can almost think about the story of the American Paralysis Association and the Reeve Foundation um, as a metaphor for what's gone on in the field of spinal cord research. Um, back in the early 80s, we talked about a cure for spinal cord injury. And um, gradually, over the ensuing years and decades, uh, basic science began to unearth the complexities of the spinal cord and, frankly, of injury. And um, people living with spinal cord injury began to raise their voices about what it was that they wanted from science. And as you'll see in some of the slides that I'm going to show you about the research that the Reeve Foundation has funded, um, as the field has matured, it's expanded. So when we began back in the early 80s, we funded regeneration research because that's, that's, that was the holy grail, as uh, many people like to say. Um, gradually, over the years, a variety of different kinds of research began to be introduced. And so today, for example, we focus um, a lot of our research dollars on the rehabilitation end of the spinal cord injury continuum. Not building better wheelchairs, there are organizations out there that do an admirable job of that, but really looking at the underlying biology of injury and certain kinds of rehabilitation. So it's been an amazing journey, I think, for the field, for all of you who are living with spinal cord injury, and certainly um, for me personally. 
So um, we, along with several name changes uh, over the years, have um, adopted a new tagline, which is today's care and tomorrow's cure. And I just want to um, address that for a minute. So back when we were the American Paralysis Association, our exclusive focus was research. When Chris was injured um, and he decided to uh, join the American Paralysis Association, Dana began to express her experience as a caregiver and as Chris's wife. And um, we often quote her uh, as saying that when Chris was spinal cord injured, it was like landing on the moon without a road map. And she began to advocate very, very vocally for um, care. Her emphasis was on the quality of life for Chris and her family. And um, at that point in time, APA had nothing addressing the quality of life issues. And um, it was really out of Dana's concern. You all know that Chris was single-minded. He was, he was all about research and, and developing treatments and cures for spinal cord injury. But it was really because of Dana's focus that um, we started the Christopher and Dana Reeve um, uh, Paralysis Resource Center. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit, but that's really the backstory behind today's care and tomorrow's cure. So essentially, we're a nonprofit organization. We're dedicated to um, developing funding research to develop cures for spinal cord injury, but also to improve the quality of life uh, for people living with paralysis. And our community is certainly um, broader than just the obvious suspects. So it's everyone who's newly injured. It's those who are living with paralysis now, their families, their caregivers, their friends, healthcare providers, very, very critical um, element um, in our field, scientists, and certainly society at large. About uh, two and a half years ago, the Resource Center commissioned the largest study of paralysis ever. Um, when I started back in the early 80s, everybody talked very wisely about an approximate 250,000 people being spinal cord injured and another 10 to 12,000 being injured um, on an annual basis. And interestingly enough, the 250,000 number never changed. <laughs> It never changed. So I don't know what happened to the newly injured, but they were never added into the mix. And when Chris was injured, he, um, as Chris was wont to do, said that number can't be right. So he used 400, 450,000. And we decided that the time had come to really do um, a prevalence study. So um, this was a telephone survey of 33,000 households and um, paralysis was defined in this instance using the World Health um, Organization definition. And what we found was that there were almost 5.5 million people who reported living with some form of paralysis. Um, and you can see the breakout of, of the etiology. So stroke at 29%, um, multiple sclerosis 17, really surprisingly, spinal cord injury at 23% of, um, of those who had reported some, some uh, degree of paralysis. And the causes of, so 1.275 million people living with spinal cord injury paralysis a far cry from 250,000 or even from Chris's 400 or 450,000. And I think what's important here is that um, it, gives us, it gives us strength in numbers in terms of providing more dollars for, for research, in terms of providing more dollars for uh, quality of life initiatives, um, and also in terms of dealing with, with the insurance industry. Um, and you can see here that um, causes range from motor, ve motor vehicle accidents at 24%, but interestingly, um, uh, accidents uh, among people um, working 
a very hefty 28 percent, falls 9 percent. So the, 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 the numbers are certainly shifting away from uh, car accidents. And, and partly this, I think, reflects the aging um, population in our country generally, the falls, uh, the accidents at work. So the uh, foundation also has a series of quality of life programs um, wherein we award grants to nonprofit organizations that provide services to individuals with paralysis, regardless of the cause. This, the, these uh, quality of life grants are not um, limited to uh, spinal cord injury. And the program was started, thanks to Dana, in uh, 1999, and we've awarded about 1,600 grants, totaling close to 30, $13 million. Most of them um, are grants awarded to organizations here in this country, although there, there have been some awards that have been made internationally. And um, basically, the awards break out into three uh, areas of actively achieving bridging barriers and uh, caring and coping. It's really a remarkable program. Um, and then just a little bit about the Paralysis Resource Center. So this is a program that is wholly funded through a cooperative agreement with the CDC. Um, and it, um, it uh, promotes the health and well-being of people living with a spinal cord injury, mobility impairment, and paralysis by providing comprehensive information, resources, and referral services. So we have um, a cadre of information specialists at the foundation office who man the phones and respond to emails. We have a lending library. We have streaming videos. Our paralysis um, uh, resource center website, the paralysis resource guide. We have we have um, uh, copies out outside at our table. Um, is it has been translated into a number of languages and um, roughly we are receiving about 300 uh, requests a month for assistance. And it's interesting, these are not uh, largely newly injured people. Most of the calls that we get at the Resource Center come from people who are chronically injured, who are dealing with um, everything ranging from insurance problems to accessibility issues to you name it. And so it really is a remarkable resource. Uh, the most frequently asked questions, interestingly, are about pain management, money, um, cure research, and insurance problems. And um, as you can see, the paralysis.org website is available in eight languages and uh, has about 15,000 unique visitors a month seeking online information. What's fascinating is that this is, this is a, a, a resource that is used um, internationally, and um, we, get, we get hits from countries literally all over the world. And these are the client services that are provided by uh, the Resource Center. So if you're not familiar with it, I would really encourage you um, to stop by the table and pick up some literature. So um, now to the research end of things. Uh, when we began in 1982, the scientific dogma was once damaged, the spinal cord could never be repaired. And uh, Reggie Edgerton, who's a uh, neuroscientist at UCLA, has a favorite saying that um, uh, back then the sp that uh, spinal cord research was considered to be the graveyard of neurobiology. They were pretty bleak days. The patient dogma was that uh, there was nothing more than a small, very isolated population um, that had been relegated to the sidelines. Um, there was a lack of awareness about spinal cord injury. There were certainly no treatments other than standard medical care. Um, there was very little in the way of effective resources or quality of life initiatives for people with spinal cord injury. So back then, in those early years, the community hallmarks were very little credible spinal cord research, no real appreciation for the complexity of the spinal cord or for its potential um, to repair, and outcroppings of small family foundations like the one I started with, the Stifle uh, Foundation in Short Hills, New Jersey, but also the emergence of the American Paralysis Association and the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, both of which I think began to finally shine a spotlight on, on this injury. 
So today what I hope to share with you is sort of the thinking that went into the development of the Reeve uh, Foundation research programs. This was a stepwise process. We began back in the early 80s the way most small research funding organizations begin. We, and we still do this to this day. We give out uh, relatively small pots of seed money. Um, grants to get a new idea started for an investigator so that he can collect the data he needs and then go on to larger funding sources like um, the National Institutes of Health. Um, these seed grants also are used to entice more, more established investigators to begin to apply their skills and knowledge to spinal cord injury and repair. And so our first program, um, and the only one we had for many, many years, was our individual grants program, which develops new knowledge and new talent. Um, and again, this, uh, these grants now are two-year grants, uh, $75,000 a year, uh, maximum 150000 for established investigators. And then we also offer a slightly less rich uh, two-year postdoctoral fellowship. And um, this is actually our largest program. Um, in a good year, we fund well over $4 million in new, in new individual grants. We give them to investigators all over the world. Um, I will tell you that all of our programs are, are actually driven by independent um, scientific advisory panels. Um, I don't make the decisions about where we invest our research dollars, I only have the, the, the great job of actually giving the money away. But it's, it's independent scientific peer review panels that actually make funding recommendations to our board of directors, and then our board um, authorizes the actual funding. So the individual grants, as you'll see, is overseen by something we call the Science Advisory Council. Back in the mid-90s, several scientists on our Science Advisory Council came to us and said, you know, we think the field is mature enough to add perhaps a new way of doing research. Keep the individual grants program going strong, but what about developing a collaboration network of basic scientists? And so the foundation started its International Research Consortium, which has changed over the years, but which is still going strong. Um, more recently, as the science has progressed and matured, we've developed two standing clinical networks, the Neuro Recovery Network and the North American Clinical Trials Network. And we'll talk more about those. So this schematic just um, shows you that all of our programs are focused on one thing, and that's the development of new spinal cord therapies that are going to promote recovery of function, improved health, and enhance um, the quality of life for people who actually are spinal cord injured. So this is a little bit about our individual grants program. Its mission is to cast a wide net and to fund the development of treatments for paralysis and other dysfunctions that are caused by spinal cord injury. And um, the grants range across the entire spectrum from neuroprotection, trying to develop um, interventions to limit the extent of paralysis at the time of injury or even stop it completely, regeneration, Growth inhibition, um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the fact that in the adult brain and spinal cord there are inhibitory proteins that work against uh, regeneration. And so one of the things that uh, is a very big player in the field is how to deal with these inhibitory proteins. Remyelination, um, axon guidance, it's great to get regeneration, but you have to get these guys to make the appropriate hookups Therefore, how do we send them to the right address um, once we've prompted their regrowth? Rehabilitation, again, this is not about rehab equipment. This is about how do you use rehab from a biology perspective. And then more recently, um, uh, we actually have a very full portfolio of projects that actually address the health-related uh, consequences of, of paralysis, bowel, bladder, pain, spasticity, sexual function. Um, since 1982, through this program, we've made 633, um, we've actually, let me correct that, we've funded a total of 633 labs around the world uh, to the tune of almost 
50 million dollars. The other thing that we started about 10 years ago, and of course this will resonate with all of you because what Dr. Williams and his team are doing here is the kind of thing that we have attempted to do with our spinal cord symposium. Um, one of the things that we became acutely aware of is that there really wasn't a lot of dialogue between the patient community and, 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 and basic scientists. Um, and so 10 years ago, we started with our individual grantees holding a meeting every other year where our active grantees were expected to come and spend a couple of days presenting their science and um, talking to each other and forming collaborations. And we, in, we invited members of the spinal cord community to join them. And I have to say that the first time we did it, uh, the meeting was in Chicago, and it was, and it was an incredible high for everybody, for the patients, for the scientists, most of them PhDs, um, and almost all of them at that time, without any kind of interaction, with the patients, um, they were doing research supposedly to help. And my favorite quote is, is one after that meeting from Lynn Jakeman, who uh, was and still is at Ohio State. And she just wrote to us and said, you know, I'd do anything to come back to another one of these meetings. It was so energizing and it was so exciting to actually rub elbows with the patients and learn from them what they want. And um, we had, we had a, a, a note after that first meeting from one of our scientists who said, you know, that meeting has changed me forever. I go to my bench now in the morning and I think differently about my research. And um, we're actually coming up on our next meeting in a couple of months in, um, in Phoenix. What we've done this year is something new. We've actually expanded now and we're going to include not just our individual uh, grant awardees, but, but uh, representatives from all four of our research programs. So I think it's, I think it's going to be a very interesting meeting with the two clinical networks there much more focused on, on sort of translation and the applied end of, of, of science. So the other thing is that we really do encourage collaboration and um, so we, out of these uh, past meetings, we've given um, five, five and six uh, small awards for investigators who attend the meeting to do collaborative projects that come out of their interactions at that meeting. Um, this is our Standing Science Advisory Council. This uh, um, is a panel of volunteer senior scientists um, who actually report directly um, to the research planning committee of our board of directors. And um, the chair of, of our research planning committee is a wonderful gentleman by the name of uh, Arnie Snyder who attends all of these science advisory council meetings, our consortium meetings, and, and he then goes back to his colleagues on the board with the science advisory council's funding recommendations. And I just wanted you to see these names, to see the broad representation that we have at the present time. Uh, Jackie Bresnahan is our new chair. She just took over um, about six months ago and she's at the University of California, San Francisco. These are remarkable meetings. They uh, last for a day and a half. We generally have about 120 or 125 research proposals to review. Um, and these, these wonderful scientists give so generously of their time and their expertise. And um, they're so aware of what it is that um, people living with spinal cord injury need and want, and very aware of how difficult it is to raise research dollars. And so their recommendations are just incredible. They base their recommendations both on the scientific merit of the proposal, but also on the um, uh, relevance to the Reeve Foundation's research priorities. So those are the two um, elements that are taken under consideration when they peer review these proposals. 
So the next program is the International Research Consortium, and essentially this is a group of uh, pretty much basic science labs, right now six strong. When we started out, we were eight, and we've sort of varied between six and eight, depending on what year it was and what had gone on. But they're looking to develop ways to repair and um, to pr promote repair and functional recovery in the chronically injured spinal cord through collaborative research. One of the things that emerged from the early years of spinal cord research was the realization that the spinal cord is incredibly complex and that there is no single magic bullet, that it's going to take um, expertise and information from labs all over the world, and we are not going to have a single magic bullet therapy, that therapies are likely to be combinations of things. And so the thinking behind behind the consortium was to tap uh, basic scientists who had expertise in a variety of areas and ask them to come together and think collaboratively about fixing the damaged spinal cord. And um, I have to say that, that um, it's, it, it, this has been an experiment. It's been a very, very interesting process. Many of the original labs, for a variety of reasons, are no longer in the consortium. Um, this program has a standing panel of senior neuroscientists and clinicians who uh, perform the same function that the Science Advisory Council does for, um, for the individual grants program. So the consortium projects are organized around four themes, tissue repair, enhancers of regeneration and neural function, inhibitors of growth, and physical therapy and training. And the thinking is that integrating these four approaches will um, enhance recovery of uh, function. <clears throat> there are two real hallmarks I want to talk about, collaboration and training. Um, one of the elements of the program is that every principal investigator must have a postdoctoral fellow who is assigned to the consortium research. And if you know anything about the hierarchy of research labs generally, um, it's the postdoctoral fellows and students who actually do a lot of the lion's share of bench work. And um, when we started out, each of the eight labs had one postdoctoral fellow. And gradually, um, we began to pick up steam. And at the present time, with six labs in the network, we've got 15 active associates. Four labs have two associates each. One lab has three, and one lab has four. And we move them all to twice yearly meetings. Um, they travel back and forth between and among the labs. And um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful training experience for them. And by my last count, we've got 40 former consortium associates who are now all out. Um, they're independent investigators, and their labs are focused on spinal cord research. And so, again, through our postdoctoral fellowship grants in the individual uh, grants program, as well as through the consortium, one of our imperatives is to train the next generation of spinal cord investigators. Um, and then the other thing is this notion of doing collaborative research. Um, and so at this point in time, there are 23 separate projects that are either underway or in the planning stages. And primarily, these projects focus on looking at combinations of interventions, not a trivial matter um, in spinal cord research. And then also under the consortium, we do have a fair number of stem cell projects um, that are underway because two of the labs have a real focus on stem cell biology. These are the members of the uh, consortium right now, uh, the Schwab Lab in Switzerland and the Fawcett Lab in the UK are our European representatives, and um, the rest of the labs are here in the United States. Um, we just lost our most uh, uh, recent lab, uh, Dr. Mary Bungie from the uh, Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, had been one of the original um, uh, labs in the consortium. And Mary is, uh, although not retiring, she still has a very active uh, lab at Miami, um, but she just decided that it was really time for her to start winding down a little bit of her commitment. So um, she rotated out of the program um, at the end of last year. 
The other thing that we have that supports the work of these um, labs, which are very far flung, is we have developed core laboratories, a viral vector lab, a stem cell lab, and then an animal lab at the University of California. California, Irvine, which is actually headed now by a former consortium um, associate. And these are the members of the uh, advisory panel, again, like SAC, they're senior scientists and clinicians who report to the research planning committee of the board. They provide critique and commentary on consortium objectives, plans, and accomplishments. And I should say that um, these four uh, uh, individuals also do attend the meetings. And um, they are, they are um, really, I call them my wise men. And they are just, they're awesome, all of them. And um, three of them are actually uh, clinicians. Two of them are neurosurgeons. And so one of the things that they serve to do is keep these basic scientists focused on the patient and focused on thinking about how one is going to deliver therapies that, that are in development, because that's, a, that's, that's obviously a very big challenge in this field. The Neuro Recovery Network is um, new, relatively new. It's about three and a half years old, and it grew out of um, um, a line of work that has been ongoing for several decades. And the mission of this network is to provide um, for specialized centers that do standardized, evidence-based, activity-based therapies for people with spinal cord injury and other disorders. Initially, right now, the, um, the uh, intervention that the NRN is deploying is something called body weight support treadmill therapy. And I'm sure most of you know that uh, Steve Williams is the director at Boston Medical Center of um, the Neuro Recovery Network Center there. Um, some of the hallmarks of this is this is an enormous program, and um, some of the hallmarks of this are a, na a network-wide database. So when a patient comes in and enrolls in the NRN program, um, we collect data on this patient, uh, medical information about progress. Uh, data analysis then is done, and this enables the NRN to measure how effective um, the program is, what the patient's outcomes and progress have been. And um, this is really a remarkable uh, resource um, for us, but also downstream for, for the field, we think. NRN teams are very sophisticated. They're headed by center directors who can be a doctor, a physical therapist. Um, they have physicians on their teams, administrative and clinical supervisors, data managers, physical therapists, and rehab technicians. This is also um, part of the CDC funding. Um, these are the NRN centers. Um, they are located at Louisville, at Tier, at Shepherd, at McGee Rehab in Philadelphia, Ohio State. Boston Medical Center and Kessler in New Jersey. Part of the mandate for the CDC funding is that um, we get this therapy to as many people as quickly as possible. Um, for those of you who know anything about locomotor training, you know that this is a very laborious intervention to deliver. Um, and it's, it's intensive and it's expensive. And um, the centers are essentially doing research. And so in an effort to expand our reach into the patient population, uh, we conceived of a new model for the Neuro Recovery Network. And it's something that we call uh, community-based uh, NRN uh, fitness and wellness centers. Um, basically, what we are doing is taking an activity-based exercise program into fitness and wellness centers, and a component of those exercise programs is Neuro Recovery Network locomotor training. And so this has been a very gradual process. We just now have reached five uh, community fitness and wellness centers in the country. Uh, they're spread all over the place. Um, the goal is to expand these as rapidly as we can. There are two challenges. The first challenge is infrastructure. 
Um, and by that I mean that all of these facility teams are trained by the NRN centers. So it's a, it's, a, um, it's a very elaborate program that is very heavily dependent on human resources. And um, as we think about expanding the NRN program, one of the things that we have to fit into that calculus is expanding the infrastructure, expanding the people with the expertise and the training and the knowledge to actually train the new community fitness and wellness centers as they come on board. The other challenge is money. Um, uh, so what happens is that the foundation gives grants to the centers and to the facilities. And those grants are used for a variety of things, including purchasing the treadmill and the other equipment that, that is needed for the program. But the funding, the grants can also be used to help defray the, the, the expenses, the difference between, in the case of the centers, what insurance will reimburse for and what it actually costs to deliver the therapy. Um, at the present time, the uh, fitness and wellness facilities do not, do not bill uh, for reimbursement um, because they are, they're like local Ys. And um, so we are in the process. One of the things that we hope to be able to do through the NRN is to take all of the data that we have collected, analyze it, and begin to make a cogent argument to the um, insurance companies that actually this is, a, this is a viable therapy and it really does improve the health the independence, the quality of life for people who are living with paralysis. And um, in the long run, if they were to invest in, in reimbursing for this therapy long term, they would end up with much healthier, more productive clients. Um, we are in the process now of um, writing a series of papers that are going to be published in the archives um, of physical medicine and rehabilitation an analysis of the data uh, that will begin to show the kinds of outcomes and effects that we are seeing in the patient population going through the program. And I'm just going to say here that um, in our experience, every patient has changed. These are, let's, let's go back and say these are people who are outpatient. Uh, many of them are chronically injured. They have been injured for years. And um, everybody changes. Everybody changes differently, and right now we don't know enough to be able to predict how patient X is going to change. But um, we are seeing really impressive and profound improvements in things like blood pressure regulation, uh, temperature regulation, respiration. A patient or two has actually recovered uh, bladder function. We do have a handful of patients who um, uh, are walking as a result of the therapy. Again, it's, it's, I, I don't want to overstate this, but we're very, very excited and encouraged by the results. And one of the things that I would say that we know from the basic science is that any and all therapies for spinal cord injury are going to include an activity-based component. So um, now we have a network already established, up and running, that can actually standardize therapy delivery, data collection, and analysis across multiple centers. So we're very, very excited about this. Um, this is just a little bit about the uh, community fitness and wellness facilities. Really the goal is to provide you all with a continuum of care in your local communities. Um, the exercise is based on current scientific and clinical evidence, um, and the facilities offer activity-based exercise programs that are designed specifically for people who are paralyzed um, to improve cardiovascular and aerobic fitness, muscular strengthening, and flexibility. Um, and this is just a little bit about the archives. Uh, this is a 2010 winter supplement. The NRN actually applied to the archives and, and um, was, was given this supplement. And so these are examples of the kinds of papers that are 
being written, have been written, and have been submitted and are under review, but we're very excited about getting this data out um, um, into the field. The Clinical Trials Network has a very simple mission. It's to move laboratory discoveries of potential therapies to the clinic to ensure patient safety and to use um, the kinds of outcome measures that will ensure interpretable data. One of the real challenges in the spinal cord field um, is, is this business of outcome measure. How do we measure improvement? Um, <clears throat> in the lab, we have fairly sophisticated outcome measures for um, lab animals, but not necessarily the case for uh, human patients. And so one of the things that NACTIN, the Clinical Trials Network, um, is doing, and we are collaborating with a number of other groups that are also pursuing this, is um, we are developing and testing and validating more sensitive outcome measures so that we can detect small incremental improvements in clinical trials. Um, there's a theory that the reason that some of the earlier spinal cord uh, drug trials have failed is not necessarily because there was no efficacy, but because the improvement was very slight and the measures used to um, identify that movement were so grossly insensitive that the improvement was missed. So um, we're very excited about NOAA. Um, and we have actually uh, begun two projects, uh, and three others are just in the process of being contracted out. We've put together an international panel of experts uh, who constitute the NOAA task force, and so it's based on their wisdom and recommendations that we've chosen the outcome measures that we have uh, to pursue initially. These are the NACTIN sites. Um, again, they um, uh, are all over the country. This is a program that's funded by the Department of Defense, which for very obvious reasons um, has a great interest in uh, developing effective treatments for spinal cord injury. And so one of our NACTIN sites is Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Center in Washington. Um, NACTIN, too, has a, has a data registry. We have enrolled about uh, 400 uh, acutely injured patients into the NACTIN data registry. Um, we are following these patients out for a year post-injury and collecting uniform um, medical and radiological data on these patients. And... Um, uh, again, this is, this is, I think, going to be a very important contribution to the field. Like the Neuro Recovery Network, NACTIN centers and personnel have been rigorously trained so that their capacity to standardize the way they treat the patients, the way they, what data they collect, the way they collect it and um, uh, transmit it is all standardized. And all of the data are sent to our data management center at the University of Texas, Houston, where it's actually analyzed. So NACTIN is about three and a half years old, and we have spent those three and a half years gearing up for our first uh, clinical trial. It's uh, looking at the safety aspects of a neuroprotective drug called Rilazole, which is FDA approved for use in ALS patients. This is an acute injury trial. The window for delivery of Rilazole is um, 12 hours. And our goal is 36 acutely injured patients. As of yesterday, we just actually enrolled our 21st at Thomas Jefferson uh, University in, in Philadelphia. And... Um, uh, as soon as the last patient has been um, enrolled, the data, the safety data will be analyzed and a decision will be made about whether to move forward to a larger efficacy trial. Uh, really, it's all is inexpensive. It's very simple to, um, to deliver. And um, if there is, if we can identify any efficacy at all, it would be it would be a real boon to the field because right now they're just they're really other than standard of care isn't anything. So um, we're excited about this. Uh, this busy slide. I just wanted to show you um, graphically the way we have invested our 90 million dollars. So these are numbers of projects. Um, and you can see that the lion's share of money has gone into promotion of axon growth and remyelination, otherwise known as uh, regeneration. 
This slide is even busier, but um, it shows something very interesting. It shows the maturation of the field. So the pink bars are regeneration. And you can see that that's really what we funded um, in the early years. And um, essentially what we were funding um, uh, when we were particularly funding cell transplants looking, looking for regeneration was fetal tissue. And um, we still do a fair amount of that. But you can see, for example, the black and white bars. Those are um, grants awarded for rehabilitation. And you can see how much more extensively we invest money into, into the rehab end of things in the past decade or so. The yellow is an interesting story. That's inhibition uh, research. And um, the inhibitory proteins in the spinal cord were not actually identified until the late 80s. And you can see that we gave our first um, inhibition award back in uh, 1989. So where we are now, um, certainly spinal cord is on the national and international map. We're at the forefront of public awareness. We are part of the national dialogue about research priorities, funding, and advocacy. Um, there's a much larger patient population than previously thought. From a Reeve Foundation perspective, we've invested $90 million into research that spans bench to bedside. Um, we have the Resource Center. The Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Act has been passed. It has no money attached to it, but that is, that is um, our next goal, to increase federal funding for spinal cord research. Um, we've had the release of the survey results, some easing of restrictions on federal stem cell research, federal funding for our programs, and collaborative initiatives underway. Um, I would just like to end by sharing um, an experience that, that um, I had at the end of August. Um, there was a meeting held in, uh, just outside of Zurich, Switzerland, um, of, research, of spinal cord research networks. And um, these are networks that are funded by the Reeve Foundation and two European research organizations. Um, and so it was very mi much a mix of basic science, translational science, and then a lot of clinical um, uh, reporting as well. And after this two-day meeting ended, um, our research consortium stayed on for an extra day to meet. And at the start of the consortium meeting, um, we decided that it would be interesting to have everybody sitting at the table, all 30 of us, just weigh in with what was our sense of the meeting and what did we find the most interesting, the most provocative, the most discouraging. And um, what was intended to be about a 10-minute recap ended up being a two-hour discussion. I have to tell you that there was such excitement among these basic scientists. And we had had a similar meeting three years ago. And what they all said was they noted the palpable difference in um, the way scientists presented their science and talked about the development of interventions and therapies. And one of the questions that one of the most basic consortium investigators asked was, after sitting through this meeting, I'm wondering if we know enough conceptually to be able to walk away from the research bench and begin to follow those concepts to the clinic, begin to push them to the clinic. Or do we still need to do more basic science? And everybody chewed on that for a while. And in the end, being typical scientists, they said, both. We need to do both. We have wonderful concepts. We have great knowledge. We have to start really pushing it to the clinic. We can't stop looking because we still don't know what we don't know. And so that's money. <laughs> But it's also enormous, I think, optimism and really, really resounding, um, a resoundingly positive comment on the progress that has been made in this field. So I thank you. And um, now we're going to take my time is up. <laughs> thank you.
So we're going to take some questions right now, um, and I just ask again for everybody to just wait until one of the volunteers is um, able to get um, a microphone to you so that we can make sure we record your, your question. Um, there's a, a woman back here, if we could get a mic. Hi, my name is Mary Elizabeth, and I'm here with my partner today, Jim. Um, my question is, there was a collaborative meeting between scientists and patients or consumers that are spinal cord injured. Did you say there was going to be something in Phoenix, the next meeting? Oh, a, a collaborative meeting in Phoenix? Oh, yes, the, the, uh, the symposium. Oh, how does a person get on the agenda to participate? If you see me afterwards, I'll take, your, I'll take your name and contact information and we'll get in touch with you. Oh, okay. Okay? Thank you. Good. Um, I actually have a question. I wanted to know, um, under the Obama administration, if maybe the foundation has just felt a different environment start happening. Yeah, well, we were obviously encouraged by what he did. I think we, we, we had hoped, along with the science community, that he would have gone a little further, but at least um, he did open, he did, he did open um, uh, the field to freer research. Unfortunately, the recent um, uh, uh, court rulings have, have thrown um, the field into disarray again, and it is, it is remarkable how, um, how much the court ruling just impacts the work in labs that um, are receiving any federal dollars at all. Um, and, you know, I think the current wisdom now is that it really is going to take an act of, uh, Congress is going to have to act on this in order to just clear the decks and let unfettered research continue. Mm -hmm. There's a gentleman right here in the, towards the front. Mike is coming for you. Arthur Torrey from Baruch Mass. Uh, I'm wondering what Research has been going on on trying to get recovery for just straight ischemic uh, damage to his spinal cord. And also, I just heard about the injection or something that they put some stem cells in a person at Shepherd. Uh, I don't know if they'll be talking about that later on today, or if you could give us any update on what the patient's progress is. Could you restate the first part of your question? Because I think the second part, um, we're going to actually have somebody about the, the stem cells being injected directly. I, I think we're going to um, refer, that, refer to that a little bit later. So we'll get that question answered for you. But could you restate your first part? Your first, first part is, um, is just ischemic uh, spinal cord damage. Um, what, have they done any major progress on that in terms of uh, getting recovery for that? Um, ischemic damage, I should say. Ischemic. Ischemic. Um, it's, it, is, it is certainly part of our research portfolio. Um, it's, it's, I would have to tell you that I don't think we've invested an enormous amount of money into it, not because we're not interested, but because we fund what, what comes to us via, via uh, research proposals. Okay, thank you. Okay. There's a, a woman here. You know what? In terms of in terms of the the scientific progress that has actually been made in that area, I'm going to encourage you to speak to one of the actual um, scientists who who are here and who are going to be speaking later, and they can address that. I'm sure. My name is Christiana Arakusima. I'm from the Multicultural Independent Living Center of Boston. My question is: From all your research, has there been any indication or possibility for um, a spinal cord injury person to work again in the future? Any, from all the research, has there been any indication? Just repeat the last. Has, has there been any indication or a possibility for that a person with spinal cord injury could be able to work again? Oh. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, and you know, uh, the answer that I would give you there is that there are um, therapies that are being tested in labs all over the world using animals, where animals do recover an ability to walk. 
Um, again, it's not perfect, it's not pretty, but it can be functional. The one of the challenges is translating what, what is reasonably successful in an animal model into a human being. And, um, but again, that's the goal of regenerative therapies. Um, if you go back and think about what we talked about a little bit when, when I was describing the neuro recovery network, we know that for some patients with certain kinds of injuries, um, uh, activity-based um, therapy can actually promote some recovery of walking ability. So, but without minding how many years, like how long the person has been paralyzed. You know, in 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 the neuro recovery network, we've had patients who are chronically injured, 15, 20 years post injury, who have changed, and and Dr. Williams could certainly speak to that. You know, one of the things we don't know is how to predict how a patient's going to change. It's one of the things that we're trying to learn by collecting all of the data that we are and studying these patients in the neuro recovery network. But um, yes, the answer is that chronically injured patients can change too. You don't have to be acutely injured. Um, we have a woman up front here. Good afternoon. My name is Louise Beach, and I'm also at the Multicultural IL Center of Boston. I'm a senior, and I'm noticing more and more that seniors are having more falls, and um, women over the age of uh, 55 are coming down with spinal stenosis, which causes them to have the ability not to be able to walk after a while because of the severity of the pain. I live in a minority community, and I go to the Roxbury YMCA, I'm a blind swimmer. I was trying to find out in the area of the minority community in the city, is there any way to find out about funding so that we can get women to, in the inner city, to go to the, the wise. I know there's one in Quincy, but right in, the, in Roxbury there's one to go there to, to be able to strengthen themselves up and be able to uh, get the ability to use their limbs even more. Is anything set up for that? Dr. Williams is going to answer that. So I can answer that question. So as you ask if there are opportunities for women, in particular people who are um, over the age of 55, to participate in um, exercise activities around the city of Boston. And there is an exercise program for people with disabilities and for uh, elderly people, obviously, uh, at all, all wise for uh, YMCAs for elderly people. But in particular, the Quincy YMCA is set up for people with disabilities to participate. And there are specific evenings of the week that there are therapists there who volunteer their time to help pay, uh, people with spinal cord injury participate in exercise programs with adapted equipment. As, yes, so what I was just getting ready to say is that there are other YMCAs around the city, not every YMCA, that there are other YMCAs around the city that have accessible pools for swimming and do have some accessible equipment. The YMCA in Quincy was very fortunate because the uh, Travis Roy Foundation made a donation to that YMCA to help start that program with the Shepherd Center um, at the Quincy YMCA and it has continued to thrive there and I have volunteered there myself and so I know it's a very strong program. Um, but I suggest that if people are interested in specific YMCAs that you contact the YMCA in your community because you can then find out what equipment is available and if it's adapted and if there are people who volunteer there to help people with disabilities participate in exercise. As well, one of the things that I would tell you is that uh, the YMCAs across the country offer scholarships for memberships 
based on each person's individual income. So to join a YMCA does cost money, but there are scholarships and sometimes YMCA membership is free based on a person's income. So that's another way of getting free exercise at an accessible gym. So the question is, is there a way that various YMCAs around the city can have funding to have equipment as well as people? So I think that as YMCAs around the city hear from the people in their community that that is wanted, that those YMCAs will be encouraged to apply to various foundations to fund that equipment. So once again, I would say advocate for yourself by contacting your local YMCA and letting them know that you are interested in this type of program in your community and encourage them to look at beginning programs uh, as well as looking for funding to purchase the equipment so that people who have disabilities can come to that local YMCA. Does that answer the question? You're welcome. Okay. We have another question right here. Hi. Hi, um, my name is Carol from New Hampshire. Um, I've always felt fortunate that I got injured after um, the Reed Foundation was established in putting a lot of research in. My question is just how um, the foundation has been so instrumental in progress, um, moving forward with spinal cord injury awareness and research. How financially um, are you set to continue <coughs> to be a valuable resource for people. Your foundation itself, I mean, everything takes money, and um, is your foundation a healthy one to able to? So the question is, is um, the foundation set for the financial future? But how, how much, um, or basically, how can all of us help to make sure? So it's a good question. Um, we start, we are not an endowed foundation. So we start every year at ground zero, raising the money that we need. Um, and over the years, our board has developed a very uh, rigorous process for grant making. So we don't award a grant, we don't write a contract to award a grant until the money for the entire grant is in the bank. Um, but we are not guaranteed anything um, we raise money just like so many other nonprofits do. Um, an endowment is something that, that our board actually has talked about, and um, we are in the planning stages for that. It clearly makes sense. We're in this for the long haul. Um, but even with our CDC and Department of Defense grants, um, we, we work very hard for those. Um, writing proposals and submitting reports and, and um, just marching to, to those drummers. So, you know, we have a whole team of people, uh, one of whom, Trish uh, Stush, is here today with me, who do nothing but think about fundraising. I wish I could tell you we just had to think about quality of life and research, but not the case. There's a gentleman with a question right here. Uh, Mark Prater from uh, New Hampshire. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, CRISPR and Dana Free Paralysis Act passed earlier, and uh, right now there's no monies, I guess, budgeted through that process. Can you describe where we are in that legislative process to get increased funding through that uh, process? Um, yeah, so um, we do, we, we have developed um, a series of steps that we're going to go through. Um, we have congressional champions who, who push the act and who are um, very interested in putting money behind it now. And um, we actually uh, have a meeting with people at NIH in a couple of weeks to open that dialogue and start. This would not be money for the Reeve Foundation. This would be money for the field. Um, and, you know, would clearly be, be uh, proposal driven and peer reviewed and all of that. But it would not be money that we would control. It would be money for the field. Is there anything as a 
community that we can push that <laughs> process forward? My experience in Washington is that nothing happens quickly. Um, and of course, the the uh, the economic climate is such that it's um, you know I, I mean I, I understand that the government is making Sophie's choices all over the place. Um, on the other hand, I think that there's a really compelling argument to be made about where the field of research is now and how new money, added money, could really really push it forward. So we're optimistic. Right. Are there any other questions right now? Oh, we have a gentleman in the back there. Hi, I'm Rob Ice from Brookline. My question is, um, I, I, I've been injured a long time, but I see that uh, there's, there's some procedures that are being done now for people who are newly injured, like today or yesterday or, you know, even tomorrow, that there's immediately when they're injured, there's some treatments that can be done, which apparently have had some success in turning around the paralysis um, for a newly injured person. Um, a, is this correct? And B, is most of the research being spent on those people or more for the people who've been injured for several years um, or, you know, the aging population of spinal cord injured people? Um, so this is chronic versus acute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so... We fund, we fund actually probably at the end of the day more on the acute end of the spectrum, but we certainly have a very broad um, neuroprotection research portfolio. Um, and again, the scientists and doctors in the room can speak to this better, but my understanding has always been that people understood that the early breakthroughs were likely to come in the acute area simply because it's easier to, to prevent something or limit it than it is to reverse what's, what, what, what has been the damage that's been done. And, um, but, and, and so I think, for example, NACTIN testing really is all, it's a very low bar, um, and if we can preserve some nerve function, that would be awesome. Right now, we don't have anything to do that effectively. And, um, and so, yes, we certainly should be investing in, in the acute end, end of the spectrum. But the lion's share of our money has gone into, into chronic injury. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Over here. Oh. To your left. Oh, I can't see. I'm sorry. I couldn't see you. <laughs> Uh, for research purposes, do you look into the complete or incomplete injury? Like, do you differentiate between the two? Okay. Uh, neither that. one of us got that. For research purposes, do you look into a complete injury um, differently than you would an incomplete injury? So, so complete versus incomplete. Otherwise, yeah. Complete versus incomplete injury. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, we have no limits on that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, again, um, incomplete, obviously, by definition, is perhaps a slightly uh, lower bar than complete. But no, we actually fund, fund, fund a considerable amount of complete injury work. Does anyone else have a question? We have one over here. Um, I saw that you had, you said you had a collaborative meeting with the um, people from out of the United States. Do you find that their research is further along than ours? No. No. Um, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that, um, at least from the Foundation's perspective, there's been an enormous amount of back and forth and collaboration um, with, and we fund, we fund a lot of science in, in, in Europe. Um, and, you know, I think everybody is excited by the fact that the dialogue has been opened and that these research networks are actually talking to each other. And um, so, for example, our clinical trials network is working with a, a comparable network in Europe 
um, on our databases, on merging our databases, so that we would have a much larger pool of, of uh, very carefully documented patients. Um, and so, you know, I think that, um, again, this is all part of the very promising state of, of, of the field right now. It uh, looks like we have um, gotten to the, there is there someone? Couple of times. Okay, I think there's someone in the back here. With the renewed interest in stem cell research, what processes are put in place to protect research future here in the United States? Stem cell research. To, to, protect, huh? to, to protect the research in the U.S. as it yeah. goes forward. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, scientists, nonprofit organizations, research institutions um, have historically always banded together. There are organizations that are devoted exclusively. Well, the one that comes to mind is CAMR, um, really focused exclusively on protecting the right of everybody to have unfettered, um, responsible stem cell research pursued. And I have no doubt. Remember, of course, this is going on anyway with private dollars. It just becomes much more complicated and much more onerous if um, you can't commingle the uh, federal dollars with private dollars, and if you can't use a petri dish that you bought with with federal funding to do to do uh, embryonic stem cell research. So, you know, the, the science has not been stopped, but, it, but it, is in, it is certainly incredibly more challenging and difficult and time-wasting. So it's, it's, it's a very frustrating situation. I'm sure it will be resolved, um, hopefully soon. We have time for one more question, and there's a woman in the back. Um, I'm wondering it, what uh, availability of expertise and advocacy there is for families who are trying to work with insurance companies to provide for um, intensive home therapy exercise machines such as fees, bicycles, or, or other things like that. Um, we have seem to uh, run into a huge black box. Nobody knows what we're talking about when we go to our insurance company. And um, I'm wondering what resources there are for us to talk to people who can help us out and um, speak on our behalf. Yeah, so talking about insurance resources. And advocacy for yeah. insurance. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I would be happy to talk with you offline about this, but um, uh, this is something that our resource center information specialists are very highly uh, steeped in. And um, so let you and I connect afterwards. And you're going to be available during lunch yes. to talk to oh, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, great. Okay, all right, great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Please, a round of applause, please.